Okay, so now that uh, I am kind of looking back over some of the key scriptures that Michael, Dr. Michael Heiser gave, uh, where he can fluently write and read inside and out, a studied man of the language that the Bible, the Old Testament was written in. Not sure about how he handles the New Testament and Greek, but nonetheless, he is an expert in the ancient Semitic languages and the worldviews of those people of that day. One thing that I appreciate about a lot of that I appreciate about a lot of his writings, not everything he says. I don't. I, I've never found anybody that I agree with 100% of what everybody says, but there are degrees of people that I will agree to a great portion of what they say and think. One thing that I appreciate about Michael. Um, I don't appreciate that he denies Noahide. I, I think he's being a bonehead on that, to be perfectly honest. Why he is, I don't know. It kind of freaks me out. But that side, that aside, his understanding of the Jewish worldview and the people of the ancient Sumeria and the cultures of that time, understanding their cultural distinctives and the way that they thought about life and reality is a voice that he brings to giving me a good understanding. And not just him, because I usually drink from many wells. I never just drink from one well, because if I did, how would I know if I was being fooled? There should be some level of agreement on some things. So <clears throat> I like that he brings that to the table. And so I was, we've been, you know, doing these couple four videos of looking at his take on how those people thought in ancient the Middle East and how they looked at the scriptures and life and whatnot. And I was really blessed by it. I really appreciate his work and I like it. And you can do whatever you want with it. But as he was talking about verse after verse, I was a little tired earlier, but now I'm doing a little better. I started looking into some of these scriptures that are very famous scriptures that flat earth people will point to and go, see, look, and they'll pour their meaning into it. Well, this issue with first Samuel, I think it was two, two, yeah, two, eight. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sets them among princes and bestows on them a throne of honor. Huh? For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's and upon him, he has set the world. Huh? Interesting. So you start digging into what what does that verse mean? And so I don't do eisegesis. I am not interested in going through the Bible and handpicking out verses and then pouring Teresa's intent of what I think that verse means. I don't care what I think. What I care about is what the author was trying to convey to me. And that's called exegesis. I want to take dictation from the Holy Spirit through the people, 40 some different authors over thousands of years in two different, three different languages translated over to English to inform me, the eager listener of whatever it is that God wants to communicate with me. That's how I take the Bible in. And I'm a bit of a, well, very opinionated, very eager to research and learn. That's kind of just my personality. I'm a really intense person and I like to challenge myself and to grow and to learn and to think, to develop my mind and my internal being and so on and so forth. And I love the Bible. So I'm always digging into the Bible and I'm always learning something about the Bible. And there's certainly parts that I know better than other parts. Samuel, honestly, is not a book that I know really, really, really to the T. So I'm a little bit weaker in this book. But I know this concept of Hannah. She prayed while Eli was there in the temple watching her. And she was so impassioned to have a child. She wanted a child so bad that she she yanked on the heart and the emotional, I'm just going to say heartstrings of Yahweh in this incredibly beautiful and powerful prayer. And she basically so blessed the heart of God, this woman, 
in this massive display of emotion, she wanted a boy so bad. And this is where one of these verses comes from that tends to be used by flat earth proponents attaching their meaning to it. So for the foundations of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. And so they would say, well, this clearly evokes a picture of a flat earth, they would say. To which then I go, well, let's check it out from the original language. Let's make sure that what the Hebrew says for number one is what it says that you say it is. And for number two, let's pick up the context of what's being said in the verse and look at who's saying it, why they're saying it, who are they saying it to, you know, the who, what, when, where, why, et cetera, in investigative work that makes us a better Bible student. Okay. Cause I'm not trying to take a concept and then find verses to go see there it is. There it is. No, what I want to do is I want to go into the original context of the book, the chapter, break it down to the verse and kind of look at the overall. Now I haven't gone through the whole entire, all that right now. I'm just looking at this verse in this moment. I'll probably do that later. And this is actually the NIV, which I can't stand. I'm just my humble, whatever. But as I look at, here we go. As I look at what Hannah is praying to God, communicating because she wants this child and she actually ends up getting him. And she gives Samuel, who was a big deal. Okay, he was a major prophet post the judges when every man went astray and did his own thing. And he was used as a major piece to inform, to help, to assist, to bring strength and power to what would end up being some of Israel's uh, kings. One of which would be, he would pour the oil of the horn, horn is power, of the olive oil of a picture of the Holy Spirit being poured out on an individual that was to rule the kingdom. And so I know that he did that with um, Saul, right? And then he did that with David. So this guy was a major player that God uh, blessed Hannah with. And he actually grew, after he got weaned and all that, he grew up as a servant under Eli's household, learning how to be in service to the Lord. So that's kind of a little tiny portion of the backstory. Um, another thing that I find really helpful Well, again, you're looking at the context of what's going on here. You would have to convince me from this heartfelt prayer that she is begging out to God, saying these really beautiful things. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and exalts. He raises the poor from the dust, and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. He, and then here it is. Here it is, the context of this. He seats them. Oh, look at that among the princes and bestows upon them. Oh, look at that. A throne of honor. Oh, you mean in the life to come? Yeah. So when she's talking about after that verse, the very next one, she's talking about the foundations of the earth, the land, they, they're God's making. They're, it's God's deal. It's God's choice, how he wants to construct reality. And she just answered one example of how he constructs that reality. And it goes back to that, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. If you remember that, when Jesus talked about that. She's talking about you might be down and out now. You might be going through a hard time now. You might be poor now. But in God's evidential plan, if that's a word, evidential, event, um, eventual, I think is a better way to say that, excuse me, uh, um, eventual plan, excuse me, he's going to bring you up. He's got a plan for you, the dead in Yahweh and the dead in Christ. He's going to offer to you the kingdoms of the earth. 
that you might rule with him. This is the foundation of the earth that is God's. His, the, he's the one that sets the reality and he will keep to those promises is what I'm getting out of this. Do I think that in the midst of her prayer that she's bawling her eyes out? Eli said, why are you drunk? And she goes, I'm not drunk. I am heartbroken. <laughs> you know, women that are heartbroken. She's like, I need to connect with God up in this temple because I need me a baby. <laughs> And she says, I'll give you that baby back, Lord. And the Lord's ears delighted to hear that type of attitude from this woman and said, you got it. She is not in the middle of this prayer all of a sudden going, and you know what? You raise up the poor from the dust. You lift the needy from the ash heap. You seat them among princes and bestow upon them a throne of honor. And you made the earth flat. That doesn't make sense. She's not going into the ontological makeup or whatever you want to call it, the physicality of the shape of the earth. That doesn't even make sense. You can't sell me on that idea. She, she go, it goes on. He, she goes on to say what God does. He guards the steps of his faithful ones. But the wicked perish in darkness, for by his own strength. By whose strength? By what? By God's own strength. Shall no man prevail. This is about God exalting the humble, which you might remember from the Beatitudes. This is about a drastic shift in the outcome of reality for those who have trusted in him. She is not talking about the shape of the earth. And I do want to go just really quick into the Hebrew. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. But the context is the poor and the needy and how there is a coming reversal of fortune for them, especially when you start getting into powerful core themes of our inheritance. You will find the concept of inheritance for the heir that trusts in Jesus, the new creation of Christ to come, all over the Bible. I talk about it incessantly and it is found grounded in reality in like Galatians 3 and 4 Romans 8 I mean it's peppered all over the Bible so it's talking about a role reversal of inheritance for people to get a possession a property a reality a, something set like it even talks about possession or property to divide the land for possession to divide for possess it says it again to possess oneself to be allotted to made be, be made to possess. That's talking about the new Jerusalem and the new earth and the new heavens and everything that you see at after the 7,000 years later on in Revelation 21. You can also read about it in Hebrews. Start in chapter 11 and do chapter 12. They're not that long. And it talks about how these people like Moses, all these people, they were walking away from the pleasures of this earth for a reality that will be grounded in God. And they were looking for a city whose foundation was not made with human hands or something to that effect. Maybe we'll end up doing another video looking at those particular verses because it all ties into a core theme that you see as a Eden renewed by the end of the Bible. Not the last chapter, but the second to last chapter in 21. Revelation. So it's talking about this coming role reversal for those who trust in Christ. And this idea of the inheritance is the bema that you're working for, right? It is this idea that he will make some rulers of five cities and some of 10 and so on and so forth. So this whole idea of pillars, it, they're not actual literal pillars that God sets the earth on when you go through all this or we're running out of time. So I'm wrapping it up. It's talking about the strength of pillars that are used in a way of saying that God's intent, God's goal, God's God's role, God's promise of what he's doing, this earth to come, this life to come, heaven forever on earth secured is coming. It's it, his promises are strong as pillars. His intent are strong and secure and foundational. You can trust him. He is the object of this. This is not talking about the shape of the earth 
and he has set upon them the world. There's a current world that is going to run for 7,000 years with the beast that I'm not going to talk about right now. And then after that is like the eighth day. The eighth, tip it over, and it becomes the eternity symbol. This is talking about his end goal of blessing his new creation in Christ. This is not talking about the shape of the earth. 